there and welcome to this week's training video. We're going to be a little bit different this week. We're going to be talking about something called your happy skills. And happy skills are things that the dog literally does naturally. And if you've had the benefit of having had your dog or your puppy since um, they were born or when you got them from the um, from the, the breeder or wherever you got your puppy from, then you probably are aware of at least one or two things that they just kind of do naturally that makes them happy. Now, they fall into the category of funny, uh, good, and somewhat annoying and frustrating. So, hi bud, come here. Here, moment's gonna come and, gonna come and visit us for a, for a minute here just to say, uh, just to say hi. So we're going to talk about uh, that particular that particular thing today. We call them happy skills. So I'm going to tell you in a bit more in story form. Could you get down now, please? Thanks, bud. Thanks, bud. Good job. A little bit more in story form this time. So when I first landed in Seattle, which is where my English cockers come from, I was so <laughs> excited to meet this litter of puppies that I had watched by video as they grew. Uh, my good friend Karen, who's the breeder, had picked out two puppies, two possible puppies for me that she knew based on my criteria, um, because my puppies all come from all come from her. So she knew what I was looking for, and she knew what would fit the bill. And so there was Blue Boy, and there was Green Boy. And while this looks like Blue Boy right now, this is not Blue Boy. This is not Blue Boy. Thank you. Could you get down? Thanks. And then Purple Girl was my perfect dog. But at the time, I simply couldn't bring another female into the mix. Otherwise, we would have had World War III. Um, so all my dogs are intact. And at the time, my oldest male, a Gordon Setter, was nearing the end of his life. And his feet were big feet to fill for the next boy. So Karen asked if, as if she really needed to ask, if I wanted to go out into the yard with all the puppies who were just coming up to eight weeks old. Hell yeah, there's nothing I love, love more than seeing puppies rumbling and tumbling and learning about stuff. And today, I actually was the new stuff. And more specifically, my shoes were the new stuff attached to me. And the thing about English Cocker Spaniels is that they have long ears. Here, moment, come here for a minute. Come here. Now these are these are trimmed off. These are trimmed off ears, but their ears, that's tr that's a trimmed ear. It goes right to the end of his nose. So you can imagine when they've got feathers on them and they can have up to, you know, up to one, two inches of, of feathers on them that are super easy to step on accidentally. And so I made my way to the top of a slight hill uh, that many of the eight puppies seem to only be able to navigate by walking up and rolling down, which is pretty co pretty common. So the walk has taken me about five minutes to cover 20 feet because there's a puppy attached to my foot. And I was making sure that I wasn't going to step on his ears. When I'm not in my full business work, I tend to wear these Solomon shoes. I have like Solomons of every 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 different type and they cover these Kevlar laces that are a loop like they're single pull pull loop and somehow he's managed to get that pulled out from my shoe. So it's like a little tug on on my shoes. So each time I remove them there's a pup very puppy like hey 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 mom and he races back to my feet. So stopping is of no use since he's very, very quickly figured out that the foot is going to move again. And he's pretty patient. So he's as smart as I thought he was going to be from the videos. So check off one thing. And taking my shoes off is not a solution since the minute I take one off, he's attached to it. And off it goes for a tour of the yard, now with five other puppies assisting him. And just as a bit of an aside, he's just turning six, year, six years old in this, com in this coming February. He still does that. The second that I take my shoes off, he's got them in his mouth. Or I go to get them, get them on and he's got them in his mouth. He never, ever chews the shoe. He just carries them. He just carries them around. But it's all about shoes. Now, I sound like a pretty classic new puppy owner, right? But I'm not. 
I'm a breeder, I'm a professional trainer, I'm an instructor, you guys all know that. So what I'm doing is actually observing so I can make my final decision. He brings the shoe back, giving it to me though is a whole different issue. The other puppies have totally lost interest in what he was doing, seemingly amused by anything other than my shoes for short periods of time. And Blue Boy has quickly moved off my list. So remember, she had Blue Boy and she had Green Boy. Green Boy is the shoe fanatic. A half hour later, playtime's done, so I put my shoes back on, noting the little tiny tooth hole in my new socks. So we all get those, right? <laughs> and, and I get up to move, and voila! There he is, attached to my foot again. And he's smart enough to move just before I move my foot, but fast enough to pick up to latch onto it as I step down. And I have yet to step on an ear. It's an entertaining game, which honestly, honestly, right here, honestly, I thought it would go away shortly. And how wrong was I? It is his number one happy skill. To this day, I can get him to do figure eights through my leg, pop back, backwards into a down, I can get him rumbly barking, and leap straight up unannounced from a sprawl down, attached to my shoe, to my shoulders, and back down, just by moving a foot in his direction. He loves my feet. Now, when he was doing his first few sessions of private agility training, my coach Fred Waters from the Canadian World Team said, you should make that into a skill when he saw him racing onto my feet and getting so excited. Now, I, on the other hand, responded, are you kidding me? Having visions of this happening while I was moving and doing a face plant, and that would be totally viewed all over social media. Like, it was all about me, not about the dog at the time. So Fred absolutely knew what he was talking about. Why wouldn't he? His Border Collies all have these awesome trick repertoires. So about a week later, we were working on speed on a plank on the ground where moment was to stay on the plank every time that we did a turn at the end which he was, he'd been doing fine through our training. We was, no problem, he was doing that wonderfully well. But I noticed to me, you know, it's those little things. It's less, like those creeps in our habits, those, those things that we do, and all of a sudden we realize we put on an extra 10 pounds, you know, or we've you know, accumulated stuff in our house that we probably shouldn't have. He had had a little growth spurt and was a little bit longer than he was a week before. So what, you say? Well, imagine one week driving a Toyota Yaris, which is the little one, and the next week it turns into a Toyota Camry, which is the bigger one. The turning radius is bigger, right? No matter what they say, it, it takes a bigger circle to turn it. So as I turned a little bit ahead of him, yeah, he turned. The perfect tandem turn. So a tandem turn is dog turns, I turn at the same time. Exact, we're a perfectly tandem turn. Except that the problem was that his radius required him to go through my legs, which seemed to pose no issue for him whatsoever. Because after all, chasing feet is his happy trick. The big problem was that my feet were moving forward. Yep, totally wiped out by a 16-week-old puppy into a face plant. No TV, just me and him in my training facility. And all I can say is, thank God for rubber infilled AstroTurf. Because as I lay there with a bruised knee, a bruised ego, and a massively happy puppy chasing my feet as I lay on the ground laughing, now one would think that after that we wouldn't do that trick again, but I guess getting that out of my system showed me how valuable the trick was. It was natural for him. He loved it. We could do it anywhere with no equipment required. The perfect happy trick. Now a similar thing happened to me when I got Ducati, my Gordon Setter, in her whelping box or out in the yard or 
you know, with her, with her litter mates out there waiting for her dinner, what I saw was a dog that seemed to love leaping like a kangaroo. She bounced on her rear feet and her front end dangled like a jellyfish. Like, I'm not kidding, just her front feet. She just held them like that. She never put the front feet on anything. She did this so much that we almost made her, her registered names Relativity Farms Hopping Hazard. This behavior has continued every day through her already nine years of life. On the other side of the fence, she hangs peering over. Dogs put their feet on the fence. All my dogs put their feet on the fence. She does this. She just hangs, stands up there. Same with a half door, same waiting for a treat. She started to, we did a little bit of training with Sit Pretty with her, not a recommended uh, training skill, but one because she had the core strength to be able to do it and because she was naturally putting herself in the vertical position. When she does her sit pretty, her feet do this. She just hangs them right there. It's cool. Now, it was so natural for her that I incorporated in, it into a happy trick called pop-up. What else would you call it? And pop-up literally means from any position, pop-up to touch my hand. So Ducati is one of my very soft yet pushy dogs and having this trick in her toolbox means that I can absolutely tell if she's in the right headspace for what we're doing. If she can't, I can use it to motivate her into the right space. So these are natural behaviors which should be where you start looking for a happy skill. Think about something your dog does freely and naturally that you could put on cue, give it a name and be able to ask for it wherever. I remember seeing um, a video with uh, Sylvia, Sylvia Trinkman. She's on the Slovenian World Agility team. She has had multiple dogs at the same time and, and individually there. And she had a very, a dog that's stressed out. But what kept her in the game and at the top of the world with this particular dog was her happy skills because she could do them anywhere. The dog just didn't think about anything else. The dog just loved, loved her happy skills. So people might think you or your dog are nuts. <laughs> Who has a happy skill where the, the dog attaches onto your, onto your feet? Some people won't understand. I had a training partner who asked her dog to kiss her each time before she started her agility run. It was something he did naturally. He was about the same size as Ducati. He was he was um, just shy of 80 pounds, a chocolate lab mix. He loved doing that. And I remember a judge saying to her when she was on the start line, you can go, you know, to which she replied, I know. He kisses before we start every run. It was how she did that final connection. It was her routine. Happy skills can ground an anxious dog. They can settle an over-the-top dog. They can keep a dog engaged in unplanned situations, allow a dog to hang out with someone that they don't know temporarily. So ideally, like I've said, you should have a small toolkit of two to four skills. I like two. You could have four but you know two is sort of the optimum number and you can even build them into a routine we've kind of done that with uh, backup we've got uh, down backup and pop those are those are moment, moments three it's now a a happy skills routine so what I'm going to ask you is think about it what's your happy skill and post it in our post it on the page or in the group post it in the comments where, wherever you'd like to post it, we really want to see your happy skills and see how they're growing. So make sure this week that you share your happy skills with us as an inspiration to others. Enjoy. Talk to you guys later. Share those moments.